Good day, this is Julia Lutinna and Alexey Rostovich, who actually has a birthday today, same as Nevzorov. So, I can congratulate Nevzorov in his absence, but uh, Alexey Rostovich, happy birthday here on this channel, and please listen or watch to that video to the end and subscribe to Yulia's channel or to Alexei's channel and uh, subscribe to the privateer station if you have not done yet. All right, so that's it with the congratulations. Let's start with uh, the difficult news from Yelenovka where everybody is kind of quiet waiting for news. And recently your uh, uh, Ukrainian Intel and released a note that uh, it appears that uh, these prisoners were tortured. They were forced to uh, be part of the propagandist videos. They refused, so they possibly were executed for that. So, what do you have any news about that, Alexei? Well, it's uh, an interesting position for me to either rely on official data or perhaps talk about some conspiracy stuff. Um, with my official position, I probably need to rely on the latter, um, on the former, rather. And um, remember, did, uh, I did note initially that it appears that people uh, who call themselves experts looked at uh, the video and said that it does appear that the explosion was from within, uh, with a high uh, charge, thermobaric or something of that kind, and it appears that some people may have been dead before uh, that event occurred. I could not exclude, and this is not the major uh, version, um, but I cannot exclude that there may have been a conflict with guards, and part of uh, these people were either killed or part of the prisoners of war were killed or had uh, bodily injuries that uh, did not allow them for active uh, motion. And then after that, uh, jailers could shoot up this building with two bumblebees, Schmel uh, flamethrowers, or Intel uh, resource in the Ukraine government uh, also basically voices that uh, supposition that people may have been dead and uh, they probably were forced to cooperate. So usually they don't uh, make statements that they have not researched. We can even look at the other uh, pieces of information floating in that bucket to analyze what was happening. Valina, uh, who was the leader of that group in Azov and uh, press secretary of that group of uh, resistance fighters uh, of Azov, in the videos that I've seen, they you can tell this is uh, made by Russian propaganda. For example, Valina said that the office of the president gave him orders to torture Russian prisoners even before the war and as if Rostovich was giving that information to, giving that order to to take videos of that and to post it. You understand that people in normal condition would not say these things on camera. So something need to have been done to them. And according to some reactions, some minor shaking, some micrometorics and glances to beyond the camera, it appears that these people are sitting in front of the camera awaiting uh, for basically under threat of physical harm. That means that, uh, what's the Russian word? They are, they undergo, yeah, different word. Um, they're, they're being subjected to a very strong psycho-emotional force uh, aiming at destruction of their will and uh, basically whoever did that to them wants them to say certain things. So basically as the result of this murder of prisoners of war, that video of Valina said uh, basically the words they wanted him to say. 
somewhat uh, softer than uh, instead of officially accusing Ukraine, he says it uh, could be, it is possible, but you know, posts like that can um, cause certain reaction. And actually trying to break people psychologically can cause an adverse reaction. If you remember uh, back in the day, in the Soviet days, when some people were captured by uh, in the um, stands uh, during the Afghanistan wars, and uh, there was a known uh, revolt in a prison camp. So here could have been the same in Yelanovka, if they were pushed beyond a certain boundary, they could have revolted and uh, some of them may have been uh, tortured or killed or wounded. Um, it doesn't stop it being a murder, it only makes it harder uh, from the criminological point of view, from the legal point of view. And the next question is, what is the price of the guarantees? What about those guarantees that uh, International Red Cross gave? Because Russia, Putin's Russia pulled themselves out of the legal field on the 24th of February this year, and now they're pulling themselves further and further out as people who do not follow the agreements. And a basic process for all, for all humankind is cooperation and communication. So if people are breaking contracts, in all times it was considered to be a severe step. I'm sorry to break it here, um, but for the Western civilization I want to say it's probably following the uh, agreement, yes. But for the Eastern civilizations, or some of them, is probably not following the agreement. And uh, they do have, there is a point of view there that uh, the contracts are for the fools and I'm a strong person and I can void those contracts. And that's why probably the West, one can say that the West is West and uh, the East sometimes is that ugly kind of East. And the dried cherry on their ugly cake is that they still recognize Azov as a terrorist organization in Russia, uh, given that Azov is a national defense detachment of Ukraine, National Guard of Ukraine, and you cannot uh, put uh, on trial prisoners of war like that. And uh, another present for me, I got a piece of news that in Belarus, all of my social media are uh, considered to be terrorist, extremist. So careful, dear viewers from Belarus. Uh, thank you, Alexei. I've been risking for a long time already, and I'm not in Belarus. So what else can guarantee the safety of people in uh, of Azov prisoners in Russian hands? Paradoxical as it is, this murder actually increases the chances of the remaining ones to survive because there is too much attention to that event. If we, if one lets this attention fade, then it may change, but we will not let it fade. There is a lot of effort now. Our political leadership, uh, special services, military are putting their attention to these events. And also even you and me here are doing our part. Um, one of the rules, Western military when they're captured, they're trained to, if you see that they are being video recorded, make sure your face is on that video. Um, statistics shows that your chances are 12 times higher to survive if your face is captured on any of the media, any of the videos. And uh, giving up any of your uh, ID information, personal information out, uh, that actually increases your chances to survive. The thing is that prisoners of war that are tortured and killed, um, they leave deep scars in the human history. So even a hundred years from now, this event will be remembered. But uh, overall, this event also does increase the chances of the remaining as of prisoners of war to survive. And now, basically, the world community is adding additional pressure on Russia, saying that if there'll be another murder of prisoners, then um, what, there'll be uh, another upset and we'll uh, issue a letter? No, no, no. Um, there'll be a reaction to that. There'll be uh, more than a word reaction to that. You know, Ukraine may get more weapons, there may be other sanctions, there may be more things happening. They actually are somewhat scared of these events and the consequences. 
they provide additional pressure on the Russian power. Problem is, besides as of there are other hundreds of Ukrainian prisoners. According to our data, Russia has about 7,000, or generally we, we track 7,000 missing MIA fighters. Um, and we pretty sure most of them are captured by Russian side and being held there. I'm citing the words of Oleg Katenka, who is in charge of our organization for a search of missing in action. And um, I know him from 2014. He is professionally um, very savvy. He knows what he is doing and uh, he is very active. So he's a good figure to be on this position. Um, so we'll be fighting to return our prisoners of war and to get more guarantees that they survive and not harmed. One of the better uh, options for us would be to capture more Russian prisoners uh, to swap. And um, the way to do that is uh, really to start offensive maneuvers, uh, offensive uh, round in this war. So I think we'll return to that matter at some point. I will return to Yelenovka a bit later. I have another important point to make. But since we decided uh, to talk about uh, perspectives of taking Russian prisoners of war uh, from the Putin fighters, um, what's happening on the front? Let's uh, switch to that. I wanted to add a couple more things about Azov. Azov's problem is that Russians have uh, Russian regime, Putin's regime has a personal hatred towards that. Because they do hate the battalion who is highly motivated, who uh, killed a lot of their uh, invaders, who was holding to the last with uh, good emotional charge to hold uh, the territory and not give it up. So this battalion is basically hitting at the core of Putin's regime, that we are not surrendering, we are not bowing down to your power. And uh, that's why their task is to, at maximum, break them psychologically, show them weak, uh, talentless, forgotten by their Ukrainian uh, government and betrayed by their country. And probably it would be best for uh, Putin's uh, regime, the way they see that, to also make them criminally liable and to trample the name of Azov, to basically reach what they see as full emotional and moral victory over that detachment. But we are here to not let them do that. I also want to add here that at the time when Alexei Navalny was poisoned uh, and people were still deciding who gave an order, maybe it was some of FSB major, uh, Sergei Parhominka, my colleague, uh, journalist in Russia, he said a famous phrase that Navalny is the clientele of Putin. Only Putin can, uh, is a nomenclature of Putin's size. Only Putin can. Uh, could have given this order. So I want to say the same thing here. Azov is Putin's nomenclature. No one of lower commands in Putin's order would have given such an order to kill them. And we remember seeing Putin's uh, reaction when his propagandists were screaming that Azov fighters need to be put to trial, need to be hung, need to be executed. And we see how this all stopped when uh, Telegram channel Nyazigar, which you and Fagin mentioned two months ago, out of the blue, published a post probably birthed in uh, Putin's crazy mind administration that uh, Ukrainians will use HIMARS to shoot up Yelenovka to kill those Azov fighters. And then now I want to ask you this question what, from your point of view, was the main factor in this decision? by Putin. So first of all, I have no qualms that I, I have no uh, reasons to not see it as a terrorist act. I see it as a concentration camp where 50 prisoners were killed. And usually when this happens, it's because their jailers killed them and the rest is jailers explanations. So how do you personally explain that terrorist act and these motives? Well, I drafted six main reasons within it. 
first, probably the main one, they gave uh, something to that uh, political patriotic uh, movement in Russia that is wildly supporting Putin and his military initiatives. The ones that are screaming loud is screaming, what are we fighting for, that Ukrainians are Nazis and Azovs, uh, Azov fighters are the core of it. So, that uh, emotional appeal was too strong and they basically took that bone and uh, took that meat and threw at them. And oh, gave them a little bit uh, something to be happy about. Second is attack on uh, Ukrainian president's office and president himself that we promised one thing, then we gave up Mariupol, then we asked Azov Stal to surrender and Azov to surrender and now we're not protecting them. So they're feeding our opposition from Moscow side or even, you know, adding additional option there that maybe Ukraine even shot it up with the HIMARS weapon. There are people who are believing that version. And then, uh, of course, to attack the Azov uh, relatives, uh, to wipe them up in psychologically and emotionally, probably not even for this time, because now it's war, people are fighting, and they're trying to stay strong. But after the war, uh, that community could react, that uh, they want to find uh, prosecution for the Ukrainian authorities who could not uh, take Azov uh, fighters uh, from the war theater back into Ukraine. Uh, third is HIMARS, of course. So, if uh, to do it proper, as if you are the real propagandist from the Russian side, you'd bring up this question to the international community about the liability of Ukraine's side and the way they're using HIMARS. And then the question of where were they and uh, where, where was the exact location of those machines. And for that intel, somebody can get 10 uh, orders of hero of Russia for that information and also to attack uh, public opinion that look you're giving them high-reaching weapons and they're killing uh, prisoners of war with it and there are some people who believe that the fourth is to just show the West that one barbarian side is fighting another barbarian so yeah we see Russians are killing Ukrainian prisoners there was another video uh, dumped into the media sphere two hours before that attack and yeah we you know atrocities happen and stuff but look Ukrainians do just the same it's barbarians fighting barbarians and why are you sanctioning ones and helping the others this is not right so that's another goal they could have been aiming for Another is probably to provoke us to become as animalistic as they are and become as uh, horrible to Russian uh, prisoners as they are to Ukrainian. And another target is their own military to basically uh, tell them, hey, look, Ukrainians are animals, that's what they are going to do to you and they'll revenge, take revenge on these videos and you'll probably be tortured and killed in their hands. So, there is a nice group of factors they could be targeting f uh, in this complex operation. Another thing is, first of all, nobody believes them. Second, everything was done very rough, so nobody believes that. But even uh, though uh, not, not a single intel operation is fully worthless there'll be some people some percentage who will still believe that uh, crap and uh, for us to give a good response to that we need to turn our heads on and find uh, good ways to answer that provocation uh, given that uh, of course we are not going to become animals we're uh, European army and we need to stay within Geneva Convention Yes, I think uh, baiting Ukrainian fighters for emotional reaction, uh, that was definitely one of the targets. And also, I think that it would be not so easy to create a military uh, martial trial of Azov fighters and then execute them. As a result, that would not be too easy for Russian administration, but uh, with such a hit, they kind of solve this problem in a different manner. 
And as I said again, Azov is definitely Putin's nomenclature for decision. Um, I remind you, you're watching Yulia Latina's channel. Um, close to 30,000 watching us live. Please do not forget to subscribe and click the like button and subscribe to Alexei's channel and to the privateer station if you're watching that in English. Another one, um, situation with Bakhmut. And by the way, uh, remember a week ago we talked about Ugligor uh, hydroelectric station and I was concerned that uh, Russian troops took that station, that Wagner uh, detachment took it over. And uh, after your conversation, I had another uh, discussion with Roman Svitan, an uh, officer from the Ukrainian army, and he actually um, berated me for uh, that point of view, basically explaining why you were right and uh, that uh, capture was not too big of a deal. And yeah, there's nothing seriously important happening there. We withdrew. There was not a serious fight with Wagner there, because otherwise they would have shown dead bodies of Ukrainian defenders. There were none, so it means that uh, our forces withdrew and they took the empty building. Um, what's changing on the front is that, look, a couple months ago, Russians could uh, do different actions on different sides of the front without moving their troops uh, within their own front. About a month and a half ago, they lost this capability, about a month ago. And all the concentration of effort they are doing now um, is created by moving the troops along the military, along the front line, because they have no reserves. Part of them are being refitted, another is destroyed, and they have nothing. Um, so, near Lysychansk, remember, there was over a month when they had 60% of all their troops concentrated there. By As a result of that uh, titanic effort, they took uh, two regional centers. Amazing. Um, they reported that they've done it, then they tried to do any other move towards Siversk, and they failed, because the defense near Siversk um, appeared impenetrable for them. They used their head to headbutt the defense, uh, got it chopped off, figured they cannot do it. That's what happened this week. Um, and the fighting on the south achieved a certain degree of uh, escalation that uh, Russian command decided to switch to a third stage of this war. The first was the initial attack, second uh, switching attention from the north and Kiev to Lugansk. And then uh, third is now moving everything they had on the eastern front to the southern front. And they have a little bit of uh, 20th Army left near Izum and Slavensk with uh, Wagner. And there is a group also near Kharkov. And uh, some people mobilized from so-called uh, LNR and DNR republics. Bakhmut and Siversk, that's basically just Chevaka and the uh, so-called armies of so-called republics, with maybe 10 Russian battalion tactical groups on the Eastern Front. It's like nothing. Um, which is somewhat um, not a good news for us, because uh, those troops from republics, they actually fight a little better than Russian troops, because they have some personal qualms and uh, they were brainwashed for the last eight years. So it's been longer. Um, the rest was moved down to Kherson Zaporozhye. And we need to differentiate between two of them, because in Zaporozhye they are being aggregated near Tokmak. Most effort is positioned uh, in Kherson. Um, they brought about, uh, they doubled their number of battalion tactical groups. So now from 15, they're about 30. A uh, big chunk of these new ones are uh, airborne troopers, light infantry. And we expect the main uh, strike to be directed at Nikolaev and supportive to Krivoy Rok. Another version would do two, two strikes, uh, equally powerful to Nikolaev and Krivoy Rok. And uh, another version would be to conduct an offensive along Dnieper and uh, another group towards Nikopol, not to Krivorog itself, but a bit to the side to Nikopol. And the third move would be major uh, in Kherson front and Zaporozhye is just to hold defensive and uh, distract us and make sure we have some troops on that front. I suspect there'll be a combined 
attack, they'll probably start moving everywhere and they'll be just observing where they get more success, success and reinforce that uh, area. We're waiting for them everywhere. Um, but for now, the hottest spot is Pesky. It's uh, for the third day already. Before we go there, that's important. Uh, we'll get back to Pesky, but to close the subject of Kherson. Everybody waited for Ukrainian offensive in Kherson. There was a creeping Ukrainian advancement happening there, where Ukrainian uh, groups were infiltrating enemy lines by three to ten people and causing Russian troops to leave their positions and withdraw. Uh, do I understand it right, that uh, Russian command shuffled Ukrainian cards in this case? No, they just changed the face, they will try to advance, get their butt kicked by our systems, and uh, then we follow them and kick them back. In a way, it actually is advantageous to us because it's much easier to uh, advance on the shoulders of a retreating army instead of uh, trying to break through a defending army. I don't even see what will they use for defense there, uh, because uh, airborne troopers, they're not really good for defense. They're good for maneuver, but uh, for defense you need heavy infantry. But we'll see. Perhaps they'll try to surprise us. I had a feeling, but again, I'm just a philologist. Um, I've seen that you guys are biting uh, Antonov Bridge, but you're not destroying it fully. That Zaluzhny is basically keeping the mouse trap open. And when uh, Russian troops started pouring in, I was surprised, do they not see that this can be a trap? Or at least that's a big risk. Do you think it was a conscious decision to attract it this way and to keep the mousetrap open, or you just did not have enough forces to destroy the dam and the bridge beforehand? What do you mean beforehand? We did hit those uh, targets before Russian troops uh, started uh, their major move to Kherson region. We attacked those targets twice. Um, we could have hit them 16 times during those two days, and there would have been no dam and no bridge, but why didn't we? So you were trapping them in, pretty much. I should uh, remind those people who remember Russian military history, there was a moment when Suvorov was defending Kinborg uh, fortress from Turkish naval attack, uh, sea des naval descent. So uh, they disembarked from one ship, disembarked from another ship, disembarked from third ship. Um, and they were, his officer was asking him, when are we starting, when are we attacking them, when are we hitting them? Uh, Suvorov said, let them all disembark. I want a dead descent, I don't want uh, uh, repelled attackers. And uh, citing him again, uh, if you don't chop the trees uh, fully, they'll regrow. So we're waiting for them to all disembark. Um, and every day we're also hitting about four big targets there with ammo and logistics, but it's for now. Uh, we're still petting them, we're not hitting them hard yet. So, to Pisky, those places I know, uh, and they're trying to surround our troops there, the same way they did near Lysychansk. Our troops are still standing there, fighting, holding position. There is no reason to get too excited. We're holding the area fine. They basically concentrated all the artillery reserves there they had available on the Eastern Front, and they tried to attack uh, everything we had there with uh, those artillery systems. And uh, Sergei Gnizdilov, uh, he was one of our warfighters on that front. He wrote a very emotional appeal on the social media, and uh, people brought it up to our at attention, and uh, Central Command uh, reacted and added our artillery to the fray, and now they're uh, responding to the Russian offensive. So this position is going to stay all right. It's, uh, another question is, why did we 
let Russians hit us for a day or two before reacting, so that's a good question. But on the other hand, um, one also needs to remember that on a 3,000 line, uh, 3,000 uh, kilometer front line, it is difficult to predict every single point when uh, where the enemy will attack. So the real help arrived there yesterday, and uh, this morning we're already giving them a lot of headache on that direction. And one needs also to understand that uh, soldier's truth is always different from the command truth, because not because uh, command is lying or soldiers are lying. Um, it is different just because of the perspective. Imagine there are three battalions. One, all three were ordered to take a certain position. The first battalion went there, lost 150 people dead. It's hell on earth for them. They got kicked back. They failed with uh, their offensive maneuver. Second group needed to encircle uh, the enemy and attack the enemy's flank. And uh, they needed to see, to wait for the moment when the first one breaks uh, the defense line and then attack on the side. Since the first one never broke through, they were kind of sitting and behind the hills. They were waiting. They ate a little. They were uh, shot at a couple times, but then they withdrew and it was not too bad. And the third were in reserve. Those even did not move out anywhere. They were just kept in reserve in case their help would be needed. These are the soldiers from the same brigade. Um, but these are three very different impressions and three very different wars. I actually talked in person to those people who were complaining. Um, I did talk to one of these brigades whom are very close to me. I know people there. And they, for the most part, were telling that, yeah, they're holding position. It's tough, it's rough, but uh, nothing unexpected. So it's really about a perspective. So I have a question um, about Piski. I did discuss it today with my good friend Roman Svitan, whom I do mention here a lot. Uh, he said the following about Piski and Bakhmut, that de facto the main problem of Piski is that it is pretty close to Donetsk. It is a suburb of Donetsk, and Russian army is trying to take that area to surround Avdiivka. An artillery that is shelling Piski is standing between uh, civilian buildings in Donetsk. So the question is, where does this artillery take their ammo from? Because Piskis really had a firewall directed at them for a couple of days. And they're saying that Russian army is bringing shells from Mariupol seaport with uh, grain transports and then unload it uh, and also from the Balsa, where they unload them on the railroad. And uh, my friend suggested uh, for Ukrainian troops, probably one of the better tactics would be to withdraw uh, and then to come back. Because after the troops withdraw, the place basically turns into that wet sugar that uh, uh, ants like so much that Russian ants will crawl over and then it'll be easier to grind them and destroy them after. So the question is, where do the Russians uh, attack these uh, targets from if HIMARS actually is uh, targeting their logistical lines? So apparently there is a bridge near Valuiki where uh, Russians are unloading uh, ammo and uh, using a lot of trucks to bring them down by the roads, by trucks. It's a huge shoulder logistically, but they're doing it from far away. So is there anything Ukraine can do to counter? This is a good uh, description, uh, Yulia, yes. Uh, personally, I think it is a good idea to withdraw from Pisky right now, given that this position is a bit protruding forward. It is not um, convenient to hold that. It's a convenient uh, area to hold in a small war, but not so much in a big war. Uh, so it's much easier to withdraw a couple miles back and then take a defensive position there. But it'll be command of Ukrainian army who will be deciding that uh, I have my own front where I fight, and but I can um, state my opinion. I think there is no reason, uh, not much reason to hold Bisky right now, but command has a bigger overview and they're not reacting to the actions of enemy in terms of uh, not letting them dictate uh, their actions or counteractions. 
отдельных. Despite uh, the posts of some highly gifted uh, warfighters, command is acting based upon their uh, ideation of this operation, and um, it is up to them how to react and what to do next. It, it is their holy right to fight the way they see fit. As for the supply lines and trucks, of course, this is. Uh, difficult for Russian uh, logistical lines to do that. It is impossible to disrupt supply line completely, uh, perhaps by nuclear strikes, but otherwise you cannot really disrupt logistic line fully. And uh, what about 300-mile attack uh, missiles? Um, yeah, but Again, you only target the ammo dumps and the warehouses. You do not. It's difficult to target a uh, moving truck with a high mars. So, our command is taking active measures as well, and Russians are countering them. The whatever they found now, it's a good way that works for them now. But uh, the cost of that decision is to. Uh, is, is hidden in losing the capability to provide enough shells for the front. Remember, in spring we had uh, such uh, areas as Pesky for 150 kilometers, not for five like now, but 150. And that was a usual war at, that, at those months. We had every day for two and a half months on the whole front line. Ukrainian infantry probably has a special place in uh, warriors' paradise at the tables of uh, Valhalla, because uh, handling and surviving what they did in those months, it's really almost impossible, especially in 21st century when there are so many things that you want to live for. And those Pesky lasted for two and a half months in an area from Izum down to Lysychansk, actually down to Babasne. Right now, it's a whole event when they attack Pesky, a five kilometer spread. This is the result of uh, Heimer's work. We did uh, create a situation where they can only create one Pisky instead of uh, 30. And it would be silly to think that Russia will not be able to create a Pisky here and there. Their tempo will slow down and we can still, you know, uh, block them after they initiate such an attack. Um, I don't know where our artillery was and how did they catch us there, uh, but a day and a half later we did bring our artillery to that to counter their offensive. So probably we had our artillery someplace else getting ready for another uh, Pisky to be created by our side, but uh, then after their attack we had to move our equipment to that portion of the front and work it back. So, we do not work on Donetsk right now, we are doing uh, attacking their warehouses and we're attacking the infantry and that gives a good uh, effect. So, in general, it is hell from the point of view uh, of a soldier of a certain detachment, but from the strategic level, situation is much better than it was a month ago. And this is the result of Heimer's work. Now the phase when they, you know, it's it's a switch of phase. Uh, the phase when they invent ways to fight us, and then the phase when we invent ways to counter that. And I suspect we will have a prevailing hand eventually. So I look at the whole situation conservatively optimistic. What can you do about their strategy of supply? Smart bombs, uh, smart UAVs, do they help with that? Yeah, we actually are expecting over a thousand uh, kamikaze UAVs um, with a charge. So each of those UAVs is minus a truck with shells. Imagine 300 of them having worked. That's a good hit on Russian logistics. It just um, takes time. These UAVs are, by the way, supplied by both US and UK. And war is difficult. Uh, Remember the war with uh, United States Army versus Iraq, five plus versus three minus, 
even then it took some time it was difficult and when three similar armies both about at about three are fighting each other everything is much slower after the war i'll tell you what uh, helped our operative directions to hold at the beginning of war you won't believe there is um, I, i need to wait till the end of war you did promise me to tell what happened in Severodonetsk. is it too early to convey that um where Remember, um, I'll, I'll call this Operation Ants on White Sugar when Russian troops were crawling into Severodonetsk and you were grinding them in that city. Um, you said I'll uh, be able to share a lot of details about that. Yes, yes, I let's wait about that too. After the war, because we can continue using the same methods in other places, so let's not tell, let's not share all our tricks for the enemy. Uh, in uh, Pisky, yeah, we could use the same thing in Pisky. And I can talk about a standard one that uh, is already out public out there. So it's when you take a group of buildings and uh, you let the enemy capture that, but you also uh, put uh, the explosives there and target your artillery on them. So when the enemy happily captures it, Everything blows up and uh, artillery also targets that area. That's the same thing we should have done back in the, the day in Donetsk airport. And we should have withdrawn and led them in an old terminal and then put a big stop, big period in that fighting and destroy them all as they get in. But that's essentially what happened seven times in Mariinka. That's just seven kilometers away from Donetsk. You guys were leaving the fortified region. Russians were taking it, and then you were taking them out and uh, recapturing it back. This is a rather standard maneuver that is taught usually at the first level of tactical study. It's just one has to wonder why do some of the commanders lack initiative. You know that uh, very often people, armies do not want to send people who are sitting in the defense line for too long. They do not want to send them into offensive. This is the psychology of uh, the ones being shot at. And the armies usually throw the new reserves that arrive to the front. They're not, they haven't been shot at for too long and they're more ready to move and to capture things. This is a military story with uh, a lot of psychology. Uh, war, as many other, probably as the most important uh, thing in war is uh, battle readiness and psychology is a big part of that. And when you look at what's happening on the battlefront, you see that a commander is just losing an initiative and missing certain things. So it helps when uh, new blood comes and new, new soldiers or officers arrive to the front line. Um, because the, well, it's understandable, the ones who've been holding and fighting for long, um, they're all just tired. But many of them also fall into the trap that uh, when you're holding, you are not uh, t holding initiative. So I'm a big proponent of not just holding, but also doing active defense, where you actually do some nightmare stuff for the opponent here and there, so they're not uh, completely in their... Uh, advancing or offensive maneuvers they that they have to watch their flanks have to watch their back because uh, you do need to keep them alert I I'm a philologist but I'm the one who likes reading about war uh, and I actually remember reading uh, some story about the Chinese commander who gave up the camp to the enemy who happily captured the camp and saw that they actually had some uh, goodies left for them and they were happy to advance and get this point but it turned out to be a trap not a success so about 50,000 watching us live we've been 45 minutes almost live we probably should let the birthday man go because it's it is his birthday today i have to remind people to subscribe and Another important thing uh, that I cannot not ask, and before we go there, I need to once again say please click the like button, subscribe to Alexei's, to Yulia's channel, and if you have not done that, subscribe to the Privateer station as well. So, 
what happened in Taiwan? That's another thing I wanted to ask you. And what's the influence of that onto the war in Ukraine? I think personally Taiwan is a glimpse of an old America when, uh, as we, I think we can call the veteran of Cold War, Nancy Pelosi showed uh, remnants of uh, the America that was fighting Soviet Union back in the day. America who was not uh, afraid of any uh, dictators of the world and any blackmail that uh, just went and did like Captain America or like Chip and Dale and was uh, providing help to the oppressed people. Unfortunately, we haven't seen America like that for a while. Very often it's replaced with uh, uh, real politic, with uh, negotiations with uh, the offenders. So, in this case, though, it was good to see how that scary, as they say, Chinese war machine with five uh, aircraft carrier groups, uh, 300 uh, warships, and it was not so much of the Chinese who were uh, revealing all these details, it was more like in Russia that they were screaming about Chinese war machine, how it can kick ass of everybody. And then America just flew in and there were a lot of threats that they might even show uh, and uh, shoot down the plane. Um, nothing like that happened. Um, America just pushed through all these warnings and uh, came to visit Taiwan, which I personally liked. Because in a way that was a straightforward provocation. So, Americans uh, just went to and did not uh, flinch. So, all these uh, bargains and all these uh, pseudo-attacks on the Taiwanese front and all that, um, we all understand that all that uh, giveaways to China or trades to China for that situation or de-escalating that situation, they're minor. We understand that uh, they are also other uh, elections happening in China at some point, and there is internal clan war fighting with Xi, with Premier Xi there, uh, because uh, many of those fractions, they do want to be more uh, friendly with the United States. And um, I think that step, what that happened with Taiwan, was good to once again point that United States are not afraid of Xi and uh, China, and uh, a good part of that was that uh, it was a, a woman leader who flew there, uh, that's in the Eastern uh, relation is uh, probably uh, worse uh, than if it was a man flying in, so that actually hit China harder. So, me personally, I like it. I like uh, boldness, politic good political boldness, when it's appropriate. And uh, as I teach in my uh, courses, there is a thing called a position. Position is what gives you power. And part of a position is norm and behavior. There are other two components of that equation, but uh, norm is what you think is norm, you personally think is norm. My personal norm doesn't matter about uh, society and their influence. It's your personal norm. So, the person needs to look inside and ask internally what is my norm in that situation. But another part is also not only to understand that, but also to stop double think and double ethics, because some people uh, do fall into that trap when they think differently. But it's important to follow your norm. So, in this case, one can see that situation where America played that norm pretty well, uh, where America stated that we do think it's a Chinese territory, sure, we do not object to that, but uh, we do understand that you want to come there and put to jail hundreds of thousands of people who are living there for a long time, and uh, we're against that. Uh, we will defend the right of these people to live uh, and to stay free uh, from the regime that we don't think is too democratic right now. And otherwise it is, of course, the territory of China. We just don't let you snuff it out. And also, of course, there was American military move in the right direction. And there was a military threat also that um, if we need to 
provide military statement, we will provide a military statement as well to support that flight. And I think it was a good approach in general. Um, that is an old day America that was very naive very often, but was looking into uh, all the oppressed cases of the world and trying to help those people. And also helped and showed that uh, to their Asian allies and also to Ukraine that America will support uh, freedom-loving peoples. And they don't care about the Putin's government and such. I actually have a feeling that Americans may have understood that they, with their political stance, let Putin grow to what he is now, and perhaps decided that uh, it is time to show that Xi Jinping should not be growing in that direction, because Xi Jinping is not Putin. That, that could be a war of a whole other magnitude. Thank you, thank you again, Alexei. That was Yulia Latina and Alexei Aristovich. We discussed, I think, most important subjects we could discuss today. Once again, happy birthday. Everybody, please subscribe, share, click like, click the bell. And, of course, happy birthday to Nevzorov. Oh, yeah, there'll be a little surprise Nevzorov's uh, Wednesdays today. Uh, there may be two birthday guys together. Okay, I see what that surprise could be. Okay, I'll go check it out. I'm glad for you. It is right when two birthday guys meet together. I think that's what's going to happen. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, I'll go watch it. And it was uh, Yulia Latina and Alexei Aristovich. Uh, thank you for joining.